Montana. Hope you're having a good day so far. Today I'm going to read from a book that uh, really influenced my writing when I read it. Um, it's called Mrs. Bridge, and this is a beautiful boxed volume of Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. Um, Mrs. Bridge was introduced to me when I was in graduate school for creative writing, and um, I was very struck by the form of this book. It's written by Evan Connell, who also wrote a wonderful book called Son of the Morning Star about the Custer battle. Um, <clears throat> anyway, the way Connell tells this story, rather than telling it in a linear fashion, he um, pieces together a bunch of short snapshots of this family from the 1950s in Kansas City. And he does an amazing job of not just capturing the time period that he wrote about and some of the morals and um, attitudes that were so prevalent during that time, um, from a woman's point of view, too. Um, I also love the fact that um, he was able to make these characters so rich and so... Um, they, he, re he really brings them to life with the, this um, method of putting together these short vignettes. Um, they're not in chronological order. He jumps around in time a lot. But as you'll see here, uh, he just really brings these characters to life. I'm going to read the first couple sections. Mrs. Bridge. One, love and marriage. Her first name was India. She was never able to get used to it. It seemed to her that her parents must have been thinking of someone else when they named her. Or were they hoping for another sort of daughter? As a child, she was often on the point of inquiring, but time passed and she never did. Now and then, while she was growing up, the idea came to her that she could get along very nicely without a husband. And to, her, and to the distress of her mother and father, this idea prevailed for a number of years after her education had been completed. But there came a summer evening and a young lawyer named Walter Bridge, very tall and dignified, red-haired, with a grimly determined, intelligent face and rather stoop-shouldered, so that even when he stood erect, his coat hung lower in the front than in the back. She had known him for several years without finding him remarkable in any way, but on this summer evening on the front porch of her parents' home, she toyed with a sprig of mint and looked at him attentively while pretending to listen to what he said. He was telling her that he intended to become rich and successful and that one day he would take his wife, whenever I finally decide to marry, he said, for he was not yet ready to commit himself. One day he would take his wife on a tour of Europe. He spoke of Ruskin and of Robert Inger Ingersoll, and he read to her that evening on the porch, later some verses from the Rubaiyat while her parents were preparing for bed, and the locusts sang in the elm trees all around. A few months after her father died, she married Walter Bridge and moved with him to Kansas City, where he had decided to establish a practice. All seemed well. The days passed, and the weeks, and the months more swiftly than in childhood, and she felt no trepidation except for certain moments in the depth of the night when, as she and her husband lay drowsily clutching each other for reassurance, anticipating the dawn, the day, and another night which might prove them both immortal, Mrs. Bridge found herself wide awake. During those moments, resting in her husband's arms, she would stare at the ceiling or at his face, which sleep robbed of strength with an uneasy expression, as though she saw or heard some intimation of the great years ahead. She was not certain what she wanted from life or what to expect from it, for she had seen so little of it. But she was sure that in some way, because she willed it to be so, her, warm, her wants and her expectations were the same. For a while after their marriage, she was in such demand that it was not unpleasant when he fell asleep. Presently, however, he began sleeping all night, and it was then she awoke more frequently and looked into the darkness, wondering about the nature of men, doubtful of the future, until at last there came a night when she shook her husband awake and spoke of her own desire. Affably, he placed one of his long white arms around her waist. She turned to him then, contentedly, expectantly, and secure. However, nothing else occurred, and in a few minutes he had gone back to sleep. 
This was the night Mrs. Bridge concluded that while marriage might be an equitable affair, love itself was not. Two children. Their first child, a girl, curiously dark, who seldom cried and who often seemed to want nothing more than to be left alone, was born when they had been married a little more than three years. They named her Ruth. After the delivery, Mrs. Bridges' first coherent words were, Is she normal? Two years later, Mrs. Bridge was then 31. Carolyn appeared, about a month ahead of time, as though she were quite able to take care of herself and was nicknamed Quirky. She was a chubby blonde, blue-eyed like her mother, more ebullient than Ruth, and more demanding. Then, two years after Carolyn, a stern little boy was born, thin and red-haired like his father, and they named him Douglas. They had not wanted more than two children, but because the first two had been girls, they had decided to try once more. Even if the third had been also been a girl, they would have let it go at that. There... There would have been no sense in continuing what would soon become amusing to other people. Mrs. Bridge, Evan Connell.